title of this presentation is Introducing a Subject, Chapter 1 of the Basic Archery Instructor Training Manual. During this presentation, I will describe the importance of an effective introduction and explain the three parts of such an introduction. Starting every presentation in this manner will help the audience or class get the most of your lesson. Why is an introduction important? Why not just start presenting the lesson or content? The introduction should help prepare the class for the topic. It will help target the listener's focus. For example, if you've just finished explaining how to set up a safe NASP archery range and are teaching determining eye dominance next, through your introduction, the class will know they should switch gears and set aside their thoughts and thinking about range setup and get ready for a new and different material. A proper introduction is usually comprised of three parts. Of course, the title of the presentation is important to state. You'll also share the purpose or objective of your covering the material. And finally, what may be the most compelling part of the introduction will be a tie-in to make the upcoming information of personal importance to each person you're speaking to. Will the introduction always be constructed in the same order? Title first, then purpose, and tie-in? Not necessarily. Which, uh, which of the parts of the introduction is the most attention-getting part? Which part might you start with if the class is just coming back from taking a break or from lunch or if they're distracted by something or someone in the class? Well, that would be the tie-in. You start with the thing that really grabs them so you can get their attention quickly in a challenging, challenging situation. Here's an example to how you might introduce range setup and safety using these three parts. <clears throat> the title of this presentation is Range Setup and Safety. The purpose of the presentation will be to demonstrate how to set up a safe and effective NASP archery range. The foundation for NASP's impeccable safety record is the range itself. This lesson ties in to your future experience as you will build upon our safety record by using NASP setup protocols. An effective introduction, as I've explained during this presentation, will promote listening. Thank you. The title of this presentation is The Effective Use of Visual Aids, Chapter 2 of the Basic Archery Instructor Training Course. During this presentation, I'll be providing tips and guidelines for you to conduct the basic archery instructor class because that's why you're here. You're in this audience because you want to be a trainer of those who will teach the students. Why use visual aids? I can tell you this, when we're trying to sell the NASP program, NASP to a school principal, it would be a whole lot easier to do so if it didn't involve bows and real arrows. But of course, not using those kinds of visual aids in an archery class would be very boring to the students. So visual aids help students listen. And that's what you want to do. As a speaker, you want the class to listen. And if you can help them do that, then you are servicing them very well. Some people are visual learners. They need to hear it, but they also need to see it in order to make the connection. You can clarify points using visual aids. For example, if you're talking about feathers on an arrow, some people may be thinking a more conventional feather straight off of the bird. But as soon as you show them fletching veins or feathers on an arrow, they can make that uh, transition from what they were thinking about to reality. It will help you reinforce points. Let's say you have shown them how to change the draw weight on a Genesis bow by using an Allen wrench to turn limb bolts. Now you bring somebody up and you let that person actually use that Allen wrench to change the draw weight, and you have just reinforced how to do that with that student and the rest of the class. Using visual aids can also aid retention by the listener of the material you present. Lots of folks believe that if you hear a lecture, you, you might retain 25% of that material over time, a fourth of what you present. You might want to get better retention when you're teaching something like archery. Some folks say that if you'll use visual aids, if you'll show them, tell them and show them, you can get retention all the way up to 50% by members of the class. 
And of course, if you'll bring that, if you'll show those students what you're talking about, you, you've lectured, you've showed them, and now you let them do that thing. For example, fletch the arrow with a jig. You can get retention up to 75%. But there is a fourth and often overlooked in a way to increase retention. If you can train someone to, and then have them teach the material, they can get up to 100% retention. So lecture is okay. Use of visual aids is better. Sh letting someone actually do something gets the retention very strong. But having them understand the material so well that they can teach it themselves gets you the greatest retention of all. Visual aids are also great cues for the instructor. I'm using this PowerPoint presentation and the sequential bullets to remind me of everything I have to talk about. If you're talking about how to set up a proper NASP arrow curtain backstop, you might have three notes on that curtain that only you can see. One is that it be loosely draped across its length and that the bottom of the curtain be six inches on the floor and the curtain is at least one arrow length from the back wall. You look around the range and if you see quiver, floor quivers on the range and you haven't talked about floor quivers yet, you know you need to do so. So they can be a great cue or an aid to you, the presenter. There are some pitfalls in using visual aids though. It's possible to uh, use a visual aid improperly or the wrong kind and actually hurt your presentation, cause a distraction to members of the class that will prevent, their from, prevent them from listening. In archery, you generally have everyone in the class's attention. Uh, it might be different for if you were teaching calculus, for example, or organic chemistry. But in archery, you generally have it. Uh, you can lose it, though, with improper use of visual aids. If you must apologize for a prop or a visual aid, don't use it. Skip it. Ditch it. Use something else. Find another way to make it happen. The visual aid could be too small. Maybe it's cluttered and busy. Could be a PowerPoint presentation, a graph with all kinds of points across it, and it's too complicated. Maybe it's unclear. Imagine showing a slide of a, of a white rabbit in a snowstorm and tell everybody it's your favorite picture and, and apologize because it's so hard to see. Well, that'll cause the class to be distracted and they'll be wondering why you showed such a poor visual aid. You could have inaccuracies in your visual aid. If you're using a text, you might misspell a word and that will cause some people to focus on that instead of the next two minutes of Im important material that you're going to cover. Additional, a tip on the avoiding the small pitfalls, something that's too small for everyone to see, is if you're using text or small objects, for every 20 feet of distance someone in the audience is from that object, that object must be at least one inch in size. So if the furthest person from you while you're speaking is 20 feet away, that object, if you're showing an object or text, must be at least an inch. If the furthest person in the class is 60 feet away, that's three twenties, that would be, that object or text needs to be three inches in size. If we wanted to show this knock, and I want to show you a picture of this knock, this might be too small for everyone in the audience to see using our 20 foot rule. So I might just blow it up so everybody can easily see that knock. And there's some other ways we can talk, we can show a bit, use a visual like that that I'll show you in just a moment. For example, you could pass around a single knock. Let's say you have 12 people in the class. You'd start with person one, they would look at it, and they'd pass it on to person two, and so on and so on until everybody had seen the knock. That would be a poor way of doing so because it would be distracting. You need to be waiting your turn to see the knock, or you'd be bored while you're waiting on other people to look at it and pass it on. You'd be obligated to talk about the knock during that entire time it was being passed around the class. And obviously that would be an awful lot of time uh, to, be, to focus on just the knock end of the arrow. Instead, you might have a big mock-up, a picture like this of the knock. Or you might put that, take that small knock in your hand and walk around the class and let everybody see it. You would then be able to control the amount of time that is being spent looking at the knock. Visual aids should be in view only when they're needed. If you've got a bunch of visual aids that you're going to use, hide them before you need to need them need to see need the class to see them or before you need to use them with a blanket or in a box or some somehow easily available but out of sight. 
And when you're finished with that visual aid, make sure you put it away, uh, get, get rid of it so folks won't be distracted by continuing to look at it. Some other pitfall avoidance techniques would be to rehearse to assure that the visual aid works the way you intend it. Does it make sense? Sometimes you have to show it to someone else to know that because it may make sense to you, but not everyone else. That's sort of my life. Is it a durable visual aid? Is it going to hold together during the entire time that you're using it? Let's say you've just fletched three arrows and the glue is still wet and you're trying to walk around the class to let everybody see that a fletching could fall off or get bumped. So that might not be durable enough to, uh, to use that way. And is it easily seen? And we've covered that quite a bit, I think, that everybody can see the visual aid. Do you know how it works? Are you competent with that visual aid? Now, surely, if you're holding up a bow and you're naming the parts, you'll know the parts of that bow. Even if you have to refer to a drawing, you'll get that. But the fletching jig can, can pose a problem for some folks. If you're not good at the, using the fletching jig or don't know how to use it, there couldn't be a worse time to learn than when you're showing the class how to use one. If, you're, if you do that, then people may suspect your competence, not just with the fletching jig, but maybe with what's coming up, the new material that's coming, or even material that you've already covered. So you want to maintain your credibility by making sure you know how that visual works. If you don't, learn to use it or figure out another way to make that point. And you need to practice the timing. If you only have 20 minutes to, tover, to cover uh, the string bow, making a string bow, you need to make sure any visuals you're going to use, you can do so in the time allotted. If, if you'll rehearse it and time yourself doing it, you'll know if you have enough time or if you can use that visual aid. Finally, there are some pitfalls that only pertain to electronic media. Make sure if you're using videos that they're cued. No sense someone having to watch this whole presentation on visual aids when all you want to do is get to the part that talks about how large or small a letter can be for someone to see it in your class. So cue that video up. Make sure the equipment is compatible. If you're using a, a electronic media like a projector and a computer, it wasn't too long ago when those items weren't compatible unless they were made by the same manufacturer. So you got to test that stuff and one, know how to use it, and two, make sure that it will work and not throw you a curve. I had a projector one time change all the font colors to my presentation to a color that was very difficult for the class to, would have been very difficult for the class to see, but I caught it during rehearsal. Extension cords need to be available. Uh, sometimes that seems obvious, but make sure you have everything you need to make the presentation work. Uh, by the way, when I was talking about typos, for at least a year, I had this presentation being used and I had misspelled the word cords in that third bullet until somebody pointed out to me in the class. And then finally, have a backup plan if the electronics fail you. If you're going to use a, vi uh, a projector, for example, to uh, make a point, you might want to have a backup like a poster or some other way to illustrate that point to the class in case the electricity or something else fails. I remember giving a presentation years ago when the first uh, space shuttle uh, was destroyed. And uh, during the presentation, it had nothing to do with the, the space shuttle, but that's why I remember it. The electricity went out, and we had to light candles, and the presentation was made without a projector. During this presentation, I've let you know, or reminded you, that visuals are essential. They will promote learning, and they'll reduce confusion if you choose your visuals carefully, rehearse and practice with them so that your your illustration will be clear to the class. They can bite you though and we've explained some ways that they can bite you if you fail to practice, rehearse and choose carefully. The title of this presentation is Conducting a Basic Archery Instructor Class, Chapter 3 of the BAIT Manual. All of you are here because you are wanting to provide certification classes for basic archery instructors, typically teachers, sometimes coaches, sometimes parents, and others. By the, with the tips that I'm going to provide you, your class will be more successful, your 
trainees will uh, understand the material better and they'll end up uh, being certified and being able to teach NASP to students for as long as they are willing to do so. During this presentation then I'm going to discuss who you will train, what is needed to conduct the class, the materials, where you would present the class, tips for success, and then I'll talk about how you wrap up the class or finish at the end of the day. Who's going to be your audience in your or your class? Who's going to make who who are these individuals going to be? Where do they come from? Well, they're typically are going to be educators, teachers, parents, shop managers. We've had principals, superintendents, uh, parents of students that have all gone to the certification class in order to know what's going on, to understand it, and to help teach the students. Great programs have parents uh, go through the training because then when the kids go home from uh, their NASP lessons, the parents can uh, help them, practice with them even. Matter of fact, 19% of the kids in NASP say that their parents take up archery because they were in the program. And so also shop managers sometimes will take the certification class so that when the kids come into their stores, they will all speak the same language. The class size should be no more than 12. If there's just one of you, just one instructor, 12 is the most that you can handle, and that's determined by the practical exercise which you you've already performed when you became BAI certified, unless you have co-instructors. If you have more than one of you, if you have, uh, you're a tr you'll be a trainer in order to conduct the class, but you could have some BAIs, a BAI, one or two or three of them that could co-instruct, and then if you had that kind of help, then you could have more than 12 people uh, in more than 12 candidates in your class. The minimum class size is about three. That's not as firm as the 12 above, but uh, the students that are, the, the teachers that are becoming certified, they need to see, they need to have repetition. They need to see you demonstrate, and they need to be able to practice it. They need to see a peer practice, uh, see, see what we're doing multiple times, and see what a group dynamic looks and feels like. So if you don't have at least three, that's hard to, hard to get. And the way you control that, of course, is keep track of uh, how many registrants you have for your class. And if you see you're not getting to the number you need, then try to postpone the class. However, if there's bad weather or something else on the day of the training and only one or two people show up, I wouldn't cancel. I'd go ahead and hold the class for those one or two people. Just have them do the practical exercise uh, twice, maybe. Or do it as a solo and then do it, uh, do it again as a pair something that will provide them repetition. And you could even do it, ag demonstrate again when they're finished to, so to sort of summarize that entire practical exercise. And it's units of three to four work best because of the safety orientation practical exercise, like four, eight, 12, uh, those, unit, those kinds of units work best. Where are you gonna conduct this class? Well, it, we've already talked about who NASP is for. It's for students as part of their in-school curriculum, presented by teachers, faculty members of that school. They're going to teach NASP in a gymnasium, usually. In some places like um, Hawaii and Arizona, they'll teach outdoors, generally, rather than in a gym. So you want to mimic where the graduates will teach. If you're certifying teachers, which is who you will be working with most of the time, you should do that in a gymnasium. There have been a few times in the past where I've been asked to conduct a training for teachers in an archery shop or an archery range. Well, that's a really uh, weak place to do it because while it works great for archery, the teachers won't get the confidence of being able to do this back home in their gymnasium unless they see it being done there. Imagine going from a, being trained on a concrete floor with padded walls, i.e. an archery, a, a, a commercial archery range, and then taking that lesson back to a gymnasium that may have a half a million dollar floor uh, and you might uh, might not be as comfortable doing making that switch as you should be. If you're training camp counselors in some states and provinces do this they'll teach teachers but then they'll also have counselors of us uh, parks come in or camp counselors come in from parks and to be certified to teach archery in an outdoor setting. Well in a case like that then you should go ahead and present your training outdoors. So the, the trainees get a chance to see what wind and maybe other kinds of weather might, uh, might do, in their, do in their training. Is the facility well suited 
or training. The minimum size is determined by the, the range, and the width of the range is determined by the length of the arrow curtain, the backstop. It's 30 foot long. So your, the, the width of your training area needs to be at least 30 feet so that you can accommodate the backstop curtain. The depth is determined by where the students will be, your candidates will be shooting from and, or, and waiting to shoot. So the waiting line needs to be at, in some, some parts of the lesson about uh, 40 feet from the uh, back wall and so the students have to have room to stand. So about 50 foot de of depth is required. So 30 by 50, it would be considered a minimum size for a place where you would provide the training. Make sure there's a safe shooting direction. If you show up at a facility or get pictures of a facility where someone's proposing that you teach, and you see that there are hazards on every wall, for example, glass walls or great big glass windows on every single wall, well, an arrow could potentially skip over a target or maybe, even though I haven't seen it happen, go through the arrow curtain or over the arrow curtain and damage that expensive wall. That would be a, uh, you'd have to find an alternate place to hold your class. I've had to conduct the class before in um, facilities that had offices with people in them on every single wall. In order to do the training, we had to make arrangements with the people downrange in those uh, on the downrange offices that they will stay in those offices until we let them know that we're on break or we have stopped shooting for the day. And finally, make sure the facility is available to you for the training during the entire time that you need it. If you're conducting a four-hour field day uh, with our new online program, you need to make sure you have four hours of that facility. Or if you're doing an all-day class, make sure that you have at least six of the eight hours that the class will take. You, you don't sh you'll start in a classroom, you'll end in the classroom, the range time is actually about three-fourths of the time you'll spend. So make sure that you're going to have it uh, for the entire time. You're going to need a, some materials. And, of course, the first thing, you, every candidate must have their own training packet, their own whistle, their own string bow, their own pocket guide, uh, training manuals. So make, you'll have, need to have those on hand uh, for all of your candidates. You'll need a complete NASP equipment kit. If you have 12 or fewer candidates, you can get by with one equipment kit, one arrow curtain, 12 bows. Make sure you have a couple of left-handed bows, bow rack, floor quivers, all the things that are part of an ASP equipment kit. A backstop curtain, of course, whether you're shooting indoors or outside. You need some posters. We make a couple of posters. One is the 11 Steps to Archery Success, 1 through 11, a list of those. And the other one is a correct draw po uh, poster showing... Uh, what a what the the an archer that is at a a correct draw length, not too short and uh, and or long, so you should have those because you will use those during the training. Floor quivers, like I mentioned before, you should have one per candidate. If you have eight people in the class, you need eight floor quivers. If you have twelve, you ha need twelve floor quivers. So as many people as you have decided to let shoot at a time, which is typically everyone, you need a quiver for each one of those. There have been times where I've showed up and made it clear that we needed that many uh, floor quiver for everybody, and the host who might have been providing the quivers will only have half and figure that two archers can share since there are two archers per lane. But uh, we do it different than that. Every archer has to have a quiver on the shooting line in front of them so that, all, so that they will be able to withdraw an arrow from the quiver, keeping the point downrange at all times. You need curtain hanging supplies. You could have uh, carabiners that go in the grommets of the curtain and hang those on a rope. But if you're going to do it that way, you need all those materials. You may find a place where the, the school already has an arrow curtain set up on cables and pulleys. And if you do, great. It's great to have a school that's already in the program host the training. for That's one of the good reasons. Painter's tape and name tags. Painter's tape or frog tape is generally what is the kind of tape that you use to put down your target shooting and waiting line. Uh, check with the school. Some some would rather it be frog tape than painter's tape. You need name tags so that everybody in the class, including yourself, can have their name attached to their shirt in a way and in a place where it won't interfere with the bowstring when shooting is occurring. And you need some blank paper or newspaper that you can use to cover up the scoring rings on the target butts. When you're teaching the process, 11 Steps to Archer Success, it's important that they shoot at blank bales or blank butts with the rings hidden. 
Some of the targets we use in the program are blank on one side with scoring rings on the other. In that case, you wouldn't need the blank paper. You just turn the targets around. And tape or pens to hang that paper uh, would be uh, good to have on hand to, to make that happen. Finally, have break items, uh, snacks, something to drink, or if you're not going to provide that, let all the candidates know that they should bring their own break items. It's very important that you stay on schedule. It shows respect for the attendees. You have a schedule, they have a schedule, and their schedule continues after the end of the training. And if you said that the training is going to be 8 to noon for a field day type training or 5 till or 8 till 5, you need to make sure that they're able to leave by that end time because they may have something that they have to do uh, later that day. And the entire agenda is required. You must teach everything on the agenda in the order that it is listed. If you go over on some lesson, for example, if you, instead of 10 minutes on determining eye dominance, you take 20 minutes, you've just eaten up 10 minutes of, of time allotted for another subject. That could end up coming out of a break or out of lunch or cause you to be pressed for time when teaching something that comes after the uh, eye, eye dominance. And if you, run, if you start having time issues, what would you skip? You have to cover all the material. If you skip the safety orientation for someone, then that someone, that teacher, will go back and put arrows and bows in every student's hand the first time they shoot. Well, before that can happen, the safety orientation has to take place, which is mean each, each student shoots by the, alone a few arrows to make sure that they'll follow the safety protocols before the teacher moves on to the next student. Once the safety orientation is done, everybody starts with arrows and bows, and everybody shoots upon the whistle command. So you must, and if you skip, for example, the bow station, that 30 minutes on naming the bow parts and how to inspect the bow and what to do if you find something during your inspection that needs to be taken care of, well, then you'll, 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 the teacher may not understand how that's to take place and how important it is. So everything needs to be covered, so you have to stay on schedule to make that happen. One of the ways to stay on schedule is to set up your range in cl classroom before the agenda starts. If your agenda starts at 8 a.m., I would show up with some folks at 7 a.m. and get the range put together in the classroom and everything ready to go so when everybody's arrived and you're ready to start, you can start on time. Some people will argue that, well, why don't you uh, go ahead and range set up in safety, that 20 minutes allotted for that subject. That's when you have the entire class help you set up the range. It sounds, sounds like a good idea. But let's say you have 10 people in the class. What you're going to do is you're going to have three or four of them hang the curtain. Another one or two is going to unbox bows and hang them on bow racks, put the bow racks together. Another two or three will end up taping all the lines on the floor. When you're finished, yeah, you've been efficient and you've set up a range, but no one that was helping you set up the range knows all of it. None of them did all of it, so they, they're all missing parts of how it, what it takes to set up that range. So you still have to cover range setup and safety anyway. So set up the range beforehand so that you'll be able to, uh, to follow the agenda precisely. You need to know the facility, where the restrooms are, water fountains, and where they should be parking. If someone's parked in the wrong place, that'll end up causing an interruption in your training. When someone says that uh, a white Chrysler is parked in the teacher's parking lot, and you'll end up having to stop for a moment while that person goes out and moves their vehicle. A nearby classroom uh, is important because you'll start, ev you'll start every class and you'll end every class in a classroom. Now, you can have tables and chairs in the gymnasium with the range. Gymnasiums are large enough for you to do that, and that's very handy, and that will work. You could also have a, a, a room nearby, near the gym, adjacent to the gym, very close, where you can uh, start the class and end the class. Lunch and breaks need to be need to be covered in the agenda. If you run out of time and start skipping breaks uh, or compressing lunch even more than we already do, uh, that would be a, a problem for some of your attendees. And if you know the topic times, then you're better able to stay on time. If you know that you have to cover eye dominance in 10 minutes th to stay on schedule, that will be helpful to you. 20 minutes for the string bow, 30 minutes for 11 steps to archery success. You know that it's going to take at least it's going to take exactly 30 minutes to do the bow station and another 20 to do the arrow station. 
So knowing all of those times will help you stay on schedule. Make sure that everyone can see and hear during your presentation. When you are explaining something that is part of the program or that you want them to do, make sure it's obvious and most of you will have zero issues with that. But if you get caught standing on one end of the class and there's 12 students uh, on a line, people on one end may have a hard time uh, hearing or seeing, uh, seeing what you're doing. If you're training in pairs, this is great. Most teachers will teach NAS solo. They'll, they have a gym class of 25 or 30 kids, and they'll teach them all by themselves. But if you're, uh, if you're certifying BAIs and uh, you have uh, someone that's going to help you uh, teach to certify those BAIs, that's great because you can have one of those be a demonstrator and one of you being the lead instructor. And it's important the way you position your, your model or your demonstrator. In this picture, you see uh, a person there on the far left frame standing out in front of the class as they're making a string bow. Well, that person stays there. The lead instructor, she, she's walking in front of him between the, the students or the candidates and him. She will, move, she will say, the st say the step and how to make it while the model makes that step. She'll then check to make sure the model has it made correctly and then look at each candidate on the line to see that they have followed the model in building that step. Once that step is completed by everybody in the class, she'll go on to the next part of making a string bow. It's important that the model stay put. They're a visual aid. They're a, a living poster, if you will. If a student on the shooting line, a candidate, is having some difficulty, if the model leaves that position and goes over to help that student, now the class doesn't have anyone to look at. They've just lost their poster or their visual aid. So that's how you use a team. One's a model and stays put while the other walks up and down making sure that all the candidates are getting the, the step correctly. You need to follow all the safety protocols yourself. You're going to teach the candidates to walk, how to carry arrows with two hands, that the shooting line is inviolate, that uh, we only go across the shooting line towards the target if when, whistle, when three whistles are blown to go get arrows. And, of course, we use whistle commands to instruct the candidates when to move and where to go and what to do. You must do all those things yourself. If you get caught hurry walking or jogging or carrying arrows with one hand, that will undermine the very thing that you're trying to teach these teachers to follow. The safety orientation or the practical exercise is the most dominant feature of a training because this is where everything that the trainees have learned up to that point, whistle commands, lines on the floor, the shooting process, how to uh, ha handle the equipment, left hand and right hand bows, everything they've learned so far comes, all to comes together in the safety orientation practical. It is where we make sure that every candidate and later for a BAI, every student knows those safety rules and can follow them before you turn them loose with a quiver full of arrows and whistle commands. So the trainer, you must demonstrate the practical first. That's gonna take you 13 to 15 minutes to demonstrate it for everyone in the class. And then each of them must perform the practical themselves either as a solo or as a pair. It, it, a solo is best, but in some cases, I'll explain a little bit later, you'll have a pair uh, work together to do the practical exercise. Every candidate must be critiqued. When one, when one of the candidates is conducting the safety orientation to their peers, one, a critiquer must shadow that presenter to make sure that they say everything correctly, they keep the language positive, they don't get ahead of themselves, uh, and if you're, if you're the critiquer, as soon as something like that happens, you stop and you have them correct that because the, the peers that they are actually teaching are learning from them as they do it. So you must make sure it's correct as the, uh, the instructor is practice teaching. If the class size is less than or equal to four, you'll have one range. You'll leave, you'll, you'll, you'll leave your range undivided, and everybody will do the solo. That's four practical exercises. Now, if you've run into a time crunch by then, you could have three of, or two of them do a solo and two of them work as a pair, and that means you'd only have three practicals instead of four. That will save you 20 to 30 minutes. If the class size is five to eight, 
you can see I, I have a, the slide shows you what you would do with each. If you have five, do three solos on a pair. That would be your five, all in one range. Six people, you'd do two solos and two pairs. Seven, you'd do one solo and then three pairs. And if you had eight, everybody would work together as a pair. But you would be able to use one range, and you'd be able to critique every person who is con performing the practical exercise. But if you have more than or equal to nine, now you're going to have to subdivide your range into additional ranges, say two ranges. And you're going to have two groups. So you'll have one, one teacher, one candidate, peer teaching to half the class, while another candidate is peer teaching to the other half of the class. Obviously, you can only be in one place critiquing those folks as they perform their practical. So in a case like that, if you have a co-instructor, it's great. And that can be a BAI. They don't have to be BAITs. If you don't have a co-instructor, then one of the candidates will be a critiquer using their notes to make sure that their peer gets everything right. And then they will, they will switch at some point during the, during the lineup. Managing questions and answers. Questions and answers can, uh, can, can get uh, time consuming. So you want to make sure that you manage those because they're really not, they're not built into the agenda. If you are ask a question that's on topic, let's say you're talking about setting up the range and you're talking about how the target butts are placed. Someone may ask you how many target butts come in a kit. Well, that's, that's relevant to the topic being discussed and it won't take you long to answer it. You'll just tell them it's five. Or if they ask you uh, uh, what, uh, how many bows are in a kit, then you can answer that question very, very quickly. If, they're going, if they ask you something that you're going to cover later, then obviously what you would do, you know what's coming later, they don't. You would say, well, we'll cover that material in a little while, and if you'll just hold on, we'll, we'll get to that then. For example, if, they, uh, if, if during um, the 11 Steps to Archery Success, they, they just ask, well, how do you repair an arrow if the fletching gets damaged? Well, you know you're going to cover that later, so you would do so. You tell them that you'll do that later. And finally, if they ask uh, questions that are unrelated uh, to the training at all, uh, for example, what brand of bow do you, the instructor, shoot, you would defer that. You would ask them to tell, ask that again during a break or at lunch or after the class, and you'll, you'll share that information with them. One of the reasons is because that's time cons that could be time-consuming. It could also be a, a hot button for someone who might have a favorite brand, and, and then they think less of you because you shoot a different brand of bow, for example. So again... You'll defer the question, ask them to ask you again, so they have to remember to ask their question rather than you have to keep up with all the questions that you've deferred. Wrapping up a basic archery class will take place when all the material is, has been covered. When you have covered uh, everything on the agenda, it, agenda, it's time to administer the exam if it's a live class. If it's a hybrid class, they've already taken the exam during that four-hour session online. If you're going to be giving the exam, then you do a f do a exam review, go over a few things that will be covered on the test, to quit sort of quiz, check for understanding, before you then go and give everyone a chance to ask questions before you administer the exam. When you administer the exam, there should be enough space that everyone has plenty of room, isn't crowded, and uh, <coughs> won't be um, uh, encouraged to copy off of a neighbor or e even inadvertently, and make sure all notes are put away because it is a closed book exam. When they've finished, you need to grade the exam either as a class or individually as they get finished and then enter those scores in our BAI database, uh, which is online. That, again, if you have a live class, and there's the website. To complete their certification, once the f if it's a field day or if it's the entire class that they've taken all in one day, you need to let them know that they have to go online when they get back home or as soon as they can and confirm that they've been certified and do a, a brief evaluation of the course, then they will, be, they will be issued a BAI number that is unique to them, and they will be officially certified. That's a step that we've recently added. To maintain their certification, they only need to keep teaching. We believe if they keep teaching, they will stay current and competent. We have an online report that must be filled out by a BAI once a year. Every year they need to go in and say, yep, I taught this year, and this is how many students I taught and, and where, for example, which school I taught them. If they fail to complete their online report, they could lose their certification. Uh, so it's important to file that report uh, each year, even if you didn't teach. 
And finally, you need to clean up the facility, make sure you leave it as you found it so that you will be able to use it again, or maybe someone else will be able to use it if they're going to hold a training or want to at that class. During this presentation, then, I've talked about who will be in your class, usually teachers. I've explained where you're going to do it. You're going to hold the class in, an, in a facility that is similar to the people you're going to train will be teaching students, teachers in a gym, for example. I've listed the materials you need, all the way from the manuals to the equipment to the tape that goes on the floor. I've emphasized how important it is to follow the agenda. It, it, the agenda is built, so it goes from simple to complex. That's the order it needs to be completed, and everything must be covered. I've also provided a few tips here and there throughout the presentation to have, to have a successful class. And then finally, I've covered how you wrap up or conclude the class so everybody leaves knowing the next step in receiving their official certification.